Since the start of Remembrance Day in 1921, Canada has transitioned from a young nation taking its first step on the world stage to a well-established middle power with a reputation to uphold. Why we remember stays constant, but the faces of our veterans are changing and have changed since the Great War. Who are today's veterans and who's still with us from past conflicts? Here is your weekly West Block Primer. By the end of the Great War in 1918, more than 600,000 Canadians had served. Nearly one in 10 died. They were the reason for Canada's first Remembrance Day in 1921. Little more than two decades after the war to end all wars, more than a million sons and daughters of Canada put on the Canadian uniform to fight yet another world war. 45,000 never came home. But the world still wasn't at peace. Just a few short years later, 26,000 Canadians deployed to Korea, and more than 500 of them gave their lives. In the 1960s, Canada's focus turned to peacekeeping, and since then, more than 120,000 Canadian soldiers have served in places like Rwanda, Bosnia, and Haiti. But the aftermath of 9-11 compelled Canada to once again take up arms to deal with the global threat. And now, more than 40,000 Canadians have served in some of Afghanistan's most dangerous regions. Time has taken its toll on Canada's heroes. Today, there are no veterans left from the First World War. Of the million who served in the Second War, just over 100,000 are with us today. And fewer than half of the Korean vets are still alive. The torch is being passed gradually to those younger heroes of Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kuwait, and Haiti, among many others, to hold high and to keep the faith. Well, while the veterans standing proudly this morning survived the battles abroad, more and more they face another battle here at home, getting access to the care that they need and the compensation they deserve. It was an ongoing theme in the House of Commons last week with a barrage of questions from the opposition. Does he believe that every veteran that serves this country deserves a proper and dignified burial service? It's a national disgrace. Why do veterans have to fight for care after they've fought for their country? Have the latest round of cuts gone too deep at Veterans Affairs? And joining me now is the Minister of Veterans Affairs, Stephen Blaney. Mr. Blaney, thanks very much for being here today. Tom, thank you so much for having me on this day that is so important for our nation, Remembrance Day. Well, let's talk about the people that are being honoured today. And, you know, I go to the comments of the former Chief of the Defence Staff, General Walt Natinchik, and the Veterans Ombudsman and the Auditor General of Canada have all said the same thing, that we are not doing enough when it comes to mental health for our veterans. Why aren't we? Well, we sure are doing and we can always do more. And that's why I'm very proud today to stand by our Canadian Armed Forces and Minister McKay, who have done tremendous outbreak in reaching out to our soldiers who need it the most, especially those returning from Afghanistan and peacekeeping mission by but Minister, these are the very people, though, that the former chief of the defense staff, the auditor general, and the veterans ombudsman say are not getting the help that they need. Well, they do get a lot of help through our operational stress and jury clinics. Did you know that we have, at this very moment, injured soldiers who have been through post-traumatic stress, who are working within the Canadian Armed Forces and Veterans Affairs Canada, and they are able to deal with soldiers to soldier and say, I can help you, I know where you've been through, let's work it out together and see how can our the government, our department, our specialist. You know, we've just hired more doctor, more nurses, more psychiatrists, so we can get some help to those who need it the most, whether physically or mentally. And so when it comes to burial for veterans who have fallen on a hard times, 67.4% uh, of the applicants for the money for burials are turned down. Why is it that somebody who fought for this country has to fight for a decent burial? Well, this program is the funeral and burial program is for our injured veteran in need. This is an important program because our veterans deserve to be well treated 
and at their very last day, they deserve to be buried properly. Are they getting enough money? They put their life at risk. Right, but 67% are being rejected in terms of coming up yes. for, for well, money. The cap has not been raised for 10 years it's true. on this program. Well, you know, we certainly can work every day to improve the quality of the service we are providing to veterans. And that's why at this, with this particular program, more than 10,000 veterans have benefited from it since 2006. And when we include the funeral and the burial assistance, it can go up to uh, a twice or three times as much as uh, what you've just referred to. But what is most important is every day we need to strive, and as a government and as a country, to improve the quality of services we are delivering to our veteran. And that's why we are investing large amount, but we are investing ourselves in what we call the new Veterans Charter. Uh, you're cutting your budget by $36 million by 2014. Are you going to put any more money into the funeral program? Are you going to put any more money into health care, uh, mental health care, as has been called for by some of the top people uh, in the military? Are you going to basically say anybody who fought for this country does not have to fight at the end of their lives for decent burial, decent care, a roof over their heads, or a job? Tom, every week, every month, every day, we are improving the service to our veterans. And we are investing more than $3 billion in our veterans' health. And we are also doing one thing, we are cutting into red tape. And who has, has asked me for that? Veterans. They say, Stephen, we are fed up by filling those forms, like what we call, this is a program. You would get fed up to send me a bill every time you have to take care to wash your window or clean, or do some house cleaning in your house. This is over now. We have moved to upfront payments. We have eliminated millions of transactions. Routine administrative tax, wait, that's over. And now our veterans get upfront payment. Yesterday, a veteran came to see me and said, Stephen, this is the right way to go. Cut the red tape and maintain and improve the benefits. You know what? That's exactly what we're doing and we will strive to do because that's what they deserve. Well, I think the one thing you and I can agree on is we that, can agree. that we owe a lot to our veterans. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Minister. Merci Appreciate beaucoup. your time. Well, joining us now for an opposition view of this is Peter Stauffer, the Veterans Affairs Critic for the NDP. Uh, Mr. Stauffer, good to have you here. Nice you, to be here, sir. You heard what the minister said. What did you think of that? I was disappointed. I heard that same rhetoric from Jean-Pierre Blackburn and Greg Thompson and other ministers before that. It is unfortunate that they seem to toe some sort of cabinet party line in this regard. All is not well within our veterans community. He knows it. The government knows it. The veterans organizations and the people who need the services know it. And it's time that we stop the rhetoric and start doing the work that they so valiantly need. And I understand there's more hype on, on this issue now because it is Veterans Week and Sunday's Remembrance Day. What happens when the poppies are down and the reefs have been laid? What happens November 12th? These men and women who serve our country and their families, including our RCMP veterans, remember say is every day. And we need to ensure that they get all the programs and services that they need in, a, in an immediate fashion. Now, the minister was saying, or he, he didn't say actually in the interview, whether he was going to put any more money into the program for burials for veterans, any more money into mental health care for veterans. Uh, in a time, though, of economic constraint, when budgets, everybody has to take a haircut, is there some justification on the part of the government saying we can't fully fund all of these programs? Well, I guess that same government would have to justify how armored limousines get traveled to India, how uh, they can have fake lake conferences, how they can grab a fake aircraft for a photo op for the defense minister. There are hundreds of millions of dollars wasted on advertising every year by this government. To say that we're fiscally uh, restrained by doing the things we have to do, Australia the United States and Britain all said in their deficit fighting, we are not going to balance the books of our country on the heroes of our country. They exempted their DVA department from those cuts. This department is facing a cut of 2,100 people, 1,300 from St. Anne's Hospital, another 800 jobs across the country in the next three years. That is a personnel cut of 2,100 out of a department of 4,100. It is the largest personnel cut of any department in Ottawa, as well as a $245 
dollar uh, fiscal cut as well. Especially when we should be doing the reverse, we should be putting more resources in the Department of Veterans Affairs to ensure the heroes of our country get the benefits they richly deserve. Uh, why do you think they do this? I mean, what are you are you saying that they care less about the veterans? than you do? No, I think deep down, you speak to individual members of Parliament, the Conservative Party, individual cabinet ministers, even Mr. Blaney himself. I honestly believe they wish to do and to do the right thing. But for whatever reason, once Mr. Blaney, if he has any power in the cabinet, I simply don't know, I'm not there. But if he did, then he should be able to tell Mr. Harper and Mr. Clement and Mr. Flaherty, this should be Canada's number one priority. If you look back at Colonel Pat Strogan, the former Ombudsman's press conference that he did with Brian Dix, he was a gentleman from Ottawa that had Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, Lou Gehrig's disease was not covered by DBA in any way. In his last breath, he said, if the government is not prepared to stand behind the troops, then be prepared to stand in front of them. On his deathbed, Mr. Harper changed the rules himself in order to ensure that any veteran with ALS gets the coverage they need. If you can do it that quickly under those emotional circumstances, imagine what you should be able to do for all our veterans community across the country in a timely manner. Peter Stauffer, Veterans Affairs Critic for the NDP, thanks very much for being here today. Thank you very much, Sharon. And just, I always like to say that every day for those that serve is Remembrance Day. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir.